and uh, we're very excited to have you joining us. In just one minute, I'm going to bring up Wendell, and he's going to kind of walk you through uh, some updates on what's been going on with Intel Capital in the past year since we last did this. Uh, I have some pretty, he has some pretty exciting news, I believe. And then after that, we will be introducing 15 new portfolio companies, and we'll be bringing the CEOs up in small groups to talk a little bit about themselves. Following all of that, uh, at 12.15, uh, we're going to have, is that correct, 12.45, we're going to have a, uh, a demo showcase uh, around the room. You see the tables, so they'll have ample opportunities for the reporters to go around and talk to the CEOs, see a little bit more about what they're doing, and um, we'll wrap everything. And we will have, uh, don't uh, fear not, we will have uh, food kind of strolling through the room, food being carried by people who are strolling uh, throughout the room uh, while that's going on. So. Uh, with all of that, I am uh, required to deliver a legal disclaimer. Um, and I'm not going to read this entire thing, uh, but what it essentially says is that our presentation and discussion today may include forward-looking statements that are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause the actual results to differ materially. Please review uh, further details regarding these risks and uncertainties and our most recent earnings release. Thank you very much. This has been a message from our lawyers. Um, with, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to bring up Wendell Brooks. He's the uh, uh, Senior Vice President of Intel Corporation and the President of Intel Capital. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you all for coming today. This is uh, one of the highlights of my job in the year every time to get to come here and talk about what we're doing at Intel Capital and more importantly to highlight and showcase uh, some of the really cool and exciting companies that we've been investing in in the past year. Uh, I think it's really important, before I do that, that I give you a little bit of perspective on what's going on at Intel, what's going on at Intel Capital, and how all of this ties together. Um, we will have an opportunity for Q&A of the portfolio companies and me at the end of our discussion, so uh, I'm around uh, the whole time and I'm accessible to anyone that wants to talk afterwards. You know, I joined Intel uh, almost three years ago exactly, uh, one year into the incredible transformation that Brian Kurzanich is taking Intel down. And if you look back at the business uh, he inherited when he became CEO, it was really a PC-centric business. Um, three quarters of our revenue came from the PC. Uh, a nice sliver came from growing technologies. Brian really ramped up our R&D spend and our focus on building out the rest of the portfolio. And last year, 40% of our revenues came from fast-growing, data-driven parts of the business. Um, that momentum is tremendous. The excitement around the office and focus on building these businesses, learning more, and making sure Intel's prepared to service uh, the fast-growing parts of the portfolio is 100% of our focus day in, day out. Um, I sit back and I, I ask myself, you know, is this trend sustainable? And I look at a world today where the average internet user generates about 1.5 gigabytes of data. Um, we bought a pretty cool company uh, earlier in the year called Mobileye, and Mobileye is going to create autonomous vehicles. Each autonomous vehicle creates four terabytes of data per day. So one car is the equivalent of 3,000 people on the internet. There are 100 million cars that get sold globally, 20 million that get sold in the US every year. If one million of those become level three, four, or five autonomous and start generating that four terabytes of data, that's equivalent people to three billion incremental people on the planet. 50% um, more internet traffic with one million cars. That's 1% penetration. Uh, if that number goes to 10, 20, 30% penetration is one example, the amount of data that gets generated consumed and used goes through the roof. And Intel helps power all of the processing that's going to back that up, all of the storage that's going to back that up, um, and hopefully many, many vehicles that are going to have that amount of data. And I've picked one small place to focus on. If you look at one of our fabs today, it, it generates one petabyte of data. Um, one petabyte of data is the equivalent of watching 12 or 13 years of high-definition television 24-7. Um, that's just one of our factories. We look at industrial automation. We look at autonomous cars. We look at AR, VR, and the ability to sense what's going around you. And there's an explosion of data coming. So we get very excited 
that this trend is going to continue and our revenue streams are gonna to continue toward data-driven businesses. And I think you hear Brian talk about us as a data company now going forward. We've created this little heuristic of what it is we're trying to accomplish at Intel. Um, with the proliferation of devices, as I talked about, smartphones, watches, cars, uh, retail establishments, cameras and security venues, infrastructure on the streets and of cities, there's gonna be more and more data that gets created. That data is going to go into the data center where it needs to be stored, processed, analyzed, and used for predictive measures like artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. That's going to then create further appetite for more data. So this cycle becomes self-perpetuating. Um, we're here to empower customer experiences and the 15 companies we're gonna talk about today are all driving different parts of this virtuous cycle, whether it's creating those customer experiences, whether it's help, helping to move and process the data, whether it's storing the data, securing the data, uh, our theme in investing, when we look at that virtuous cycle of growth, really is built um, around Intel's core strategy. And Intel Capital is here to be the front facing, forward looking eyes and ears of Intel. Um, we're making investments in companies that we can help drive to market and create success long term. Uh, all 15 companies that are gonna talk today, you know, we have a thesis that we can help them win in their subsegments. And we are wholly focused as an organization in doing that. And if you look, these are the, the subsectors where we've really been focused in the past two years in making our investments. Um, and I think we've had a, a, a fair amount of success in the past two years, which I will cut to next. Um, when I inherited Intel Capital two and a half years ago, we were making about uh, 60 new investments a year. We tended to put three to $5 million to work per investment. Uh, we were oftentimes second seat or supportive investors to some other lead investor. We have really tried in the past two years to take a leadership position in the places where we're investing. Um, and I think we've had a fair amount of success in the last year alone, uh, we led 70% of the investments we made within Intel Capital, and 60% uh, of those investments were Series A rounds, which are a little bit earlier than I think we were doing historically. So we're getting good access to companies. I think we're adding value on a level that some of our financial VC brethren uh, aren't able to do through endorsement of technology, uh, additions to the technology, and most importantly, access to our customer base. When we have things like our global summit, which I'll come back to in a minute, the ability to put Intel's top 1,000 customers together with our 350 portfolio companies gets really exciting from a revenue route to market perspective. If I look um, on the global summit, we normally had had it in the fall. Uh, I think from a calendar of events perspective, we came to the conclusion spring was better. Uh, we'll, we'll see if that's true or not, but it, it, that was my vote, and I hope we have another one of these events in the spring. Um, it will be May 2018, and I hope all of you will come join us um, out in the desert of Southern California. If I look specifically at our performance, and this is something I would typically talk about annually at the Global Summit. You know, again, I alluded to historically we'd been making 60 some odd new investments uh, a year. The past two years we've driven that down. If you look at the right side of the table, I'm blessed and we're blessed to continue to get four to $500 million of annual investment dollars from Intel. Um, so not surprisingly, the average check we're writing, the influence we're taking within companies is a lot higher than it was in our historic business, business model. Um, I get very excited that the IPO market, as I hoped a year ago when I was in front of all of you, has gotten significantly better than it was, I think. Um, the IPO pipeline, when you talk to investment bankers, continues to remain strong. Uh, we had another portfolio company just IPO today, so uh, we're hopeful that trend continues and the markets stay open because that with uh, M&A exits is the lifeblood of any VC. And being able to prove um, and generate a successful outcome for the portfolio companies is why they're all here talking to all of us and all of you. I made a commitment, well, we made a commitment uh, two and a half years ago that we were going to dedicate 
investment dollars to uh, female-led and underrepresented minority-led companies. And we started with a fun concept and decided to evolve that over time to be very much focused on everyone that's wearing an Intel Capital badge in this room is out trying to lead the way on these types of investments. Um, when we started, there was about 6% of our portfolio uh, that was invested in diverse companies. Um, at the end of last year, that number was up into double digits, and we continue to focus and grow. Uh, we're putting, you know, hopefully 20% of our dollars on average to work in making sure we are seeding the VC community and the entrepreneur community um, with female-led and URM-led businesses. I took another step in the past year, and we created a diversity internship program. And this is a message to all my CEOs in the room that you probably didn't know. We took uh, four African-American and one Hispanic person, two of them being females, as sophomores and juniors in college. Um, we gave them a full summer of Intel capital-led training. They're all coming back, or at least they're all indicating they're coming back next year. And we're encouraging them um, to go work for all of you portfolio companies and add a different perspective to your businesses. We're going to continue to pay for them. Um, I'm going to continue to bring five or six new students in as sophomores next year. And hopefully, three or four years from now, we've seeded the community with a bunch of people, number one, that are Intel Capital friendly, uh, and importantly, have different perspectives and different backgrounds in the community. So I hope all of the CEOs in the room will support me as we continue to push that initiative going forward. The reason I'm really here today and I get very excited is, uh, as Peter alluded to, we've made 15 investments uh, that we want to highlight today, totaling $60 million, um, in a group of very interesting uh, data-driven companies. And as we look at the companies we're talking about today, there's four different themes. There's the, the capturing and creating of the data. Um, there's managing that data and processing that data. There's analytics that go on top of the data to, to provide new solutions. And then most, you know, very importantly as well, they're securing that data um, from all of the various threats we see day in, day out. Um, I think it's better, I, you know, I could sit and talk about every one of these companies and go on for a long time. I think it's a lot better if we just get them on stage. Uh, again, I will be here for q and I, I think Peter's gonna lead some Q&A with the portfolio companies. But thank you all for being here and this is incredibly exciting. Uh, for me and for us. Peter. Uh, no, I, uh, I really uh, find it very energizing to work around entrepreneurs, and I also find it especially energizing to work at a place that has the kind of track record. I mean, uh, you, the reporters in the room you've seen, these are uh, $60 million of new deals that we're announcing just today, brings us to more than $560 million of new uh, investments this year. Uh, earlier this year, Intel Capital passed $12 billion lifetime, and earlier this month, uh, we invested in our 1500th uh, company since inception in 1991. Now, the only reason I mention that is because I think it kind of speaks to the, uh, the scale and the, the track record, the expertise that our investors can bring to our portfolio companies. But at the end of the day, it is all about the portfolio companies and our track record of success is really their track record of, of success. Uh, the founders that we have uh, who started the companies you're going to be hearing from come from a really amazing set of backgrounds. Just for some fun facts, we've got the former heads of software development and digital design at SpaceX. So we literally have rocket scientists in the, in the, in the, in the portfolio. Uh, we've got former hackers for the NSA and for the Israeli Defense Force. So uh, uh, they can uh, do terrible things to you if they wanted to do that. Um, we, on the other hand, have a long-time veteran of Hasbro and Mattel, so somebody who uh, made toys. And I have a nine-year-old, and so that would probably be my son's favorite person if he were here. Uh, we have uh, a young entrepreneur who became a nuclear physicist when, at the age of seven, his hometown, which was right near the Chernobyl reactor, had to be evacuated, and that led him on an amazing experience to find out about nuclear energy and led him to become a technology entrepreneur. Um, and uh, maybe the most fun fact, we have a former competitive skateboarder who still owns a skateboarding company when he's not running a cybersecurity company. Uh, these are the kinds of creative uh, energy, this is the kind of creative energy that we've got and you're about to hear from. So I'd like to, uh, without any further ado from me, bring up our first group of CEOs. These are the CEOs who are in the category that we've grouped loosely together as capturing data. Uh, if they could come up now. Uh, Neil, David, Martin, and Sergio.
And what we're going to do here is uh, each CEO is going to take a couple minutes to tell you a little bit about his company. Uh, and uh, then I will kind of uh, uh, pose a question to the group for a general little bit of discussion. And then we'll repeat that cycle four times. And then we'll have the, the group Q&A from those of you out there. So, uh, Sergio, do you mind uh, taking, uh, taking a second and just introducing yourself? Sure. So I'm Sergio Aguirre, CEO and founder of Ecopixel. I'm Martin Hitch. I'm the co-founder of Bossa Nova Robotics, and I have the claim of spending a decade at Mattel and Hasbro when I was a big kid. My name is David Lashen, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Trace. My name is Neil Sarkar, and I work for Ad Hoc Microsystems. Why don't we go from Neil back toward me. If you guys could each take a minute or so to just tell the folks about uh, uh, the company you started and, uh, and why you started with the problem you're trying to solve and the market you're trying to address. Sure. Yeah, so Ad Hoc Microsystems is a fabulous semiconductor company, and we build chipsets for human-computer interaction. So the problem we're trying to solve is that, you know, as computers become more and more pervasive and we have access to the cloud and to computation in our watches, in our phones, and in our augmented reality headsets, um, you know, the ways that we interact with these computers has to evolve. So we can't just rely on keyboards and mice anymore. And so our company is building a suite of sensors that forms a thin layer of technology that resides between humans and computers to make uh, human-computer interaction seamless and effective. So our first product is actually the world's first camera-free eye-tracking solution. So your eyes make hundreds of thousands of movements every day, and these movements reveal a wealth of information about your interests, your desires, your intentions, and even your uh, state of mind and your, your health. And so uh, up until now, in order to capture those types of information, you need to be in a tethered and controlled environment with a supercomputer connected to your eye tracker. So what we've done is we've created the world's first eye tracker that can fit unobtrusively into glasses and run off of a coin cell battery for a full day. Um, and, and using this technology, we hope to make human computer interaction seamless and effective. Thank you. David? So everyone knows that video is one of the best ways for an athlete to get better or for a coach to teach his team. But taking that video is a huge pain point. So first you have to put up the tripod and then you have to find a videographer who's moving the camera around for the whole game, and then you have to upload that video. That takes hours, and then on top of that, you're cutting up the video to find the moments that matter to the team. So you're re-watching this hour and a half long game, and what Trace does is it combines sensors, video, and artificial intelligence, and makes it painless and easy to get highlights of the game and player performance without any human interaction or any effort right after the game. So right now what happens is on the high school level or on the club level, really you don't see people using a lot of video just because it's so hard to do and is so time consuming. Um, at the pros, you of course do see that. And all you have to do is a team, a soccer team, puts a little sensor on the back of their leg, they play the game, and right after the game, they'll have the highlights for each player and the highlights for the team without any effort or any work from their part. Pardon? So <clears throat> we uh, build large-scale autonomous robots that capture imagery data in big box retail stores. And if you look at retail, you've, we all spend time in these stores. They have optimized the supply chain from source to the back of the store over the last 50 years. Once a product hits the back of the store, it's a black hole. All we know then is when things sell through the register. The way that we find out things are happening today is people, you've, you've seen people walking around stores with a handheld gun and we monotonously and painstakingly capture information on the shelf. At Bossa Nova, we drive a robot around the store, we track everything in three dimensions, so we look at every product, every shelf, every label, and from that we create productivity tasks that are driving the management of labor within the store to address those shelves to make sure that the box of cereal that you guys are in to buy is on the shelf at the right time when you want it. Yes, uh, so Echopixel, uh, we are a pioneer in uh, augmented and virtual reality in medicine. So what we've done is a software platform that drives what we call next generation displays. Uh, and it's helping us solve a very big problem in the healthcare industry. Every year there's about 600 million imaging studies done. Uh, over half of these imaging studies are 3D data. But right now doctors are looking at a series of 2D images 
um, and trying to reconstruct that anatomy in their mind. Uh, and it's only being utilized, these 20 terabytes of data that per year a hospital does, it's only being utilized primarily by one department, radiology. So by allowing clinicians to have patient-specific, true-to-size anatomy that they can interact with, uh, it's uh, something that's extending the use of images into additional clinicians, and it's helping us uh, help doctors improve patient outcomes. So uh, that's uh, what Echopixel is doing right now. Great, thanks. And I, I hope you will all stop by and see the demos. Uh, some of the, uh, as I've been explaining your, your company to people, it's kind of like gives the doctor x-ray vision into my torso, and if my spleen is in the way and he wants to see my kidney, he can just move it right out of the way, and I don't feel a thing. Um, so, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, as you guys can, can see, there's a, 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 these companies each sort of represent these entirely new uh, ways of, of capturing data and bringing it into uh, into the data stack. Uh, we've talked about, you know, over the past number of years, uh, uh, the, the, these kind of uh, interfaces. We've gone from, we've got smartphones, everybody's got a camera these days. We've got smart eyewear. We've got now, just like in the Tom Cruise movie, billboards that can recognize you as you're walking by uh, and can serve information to you that's, uh, that's unique. And, and we're just starting to see this explosion of new ways that data can be captured uh, beyond, as you said, uh, from the, the keyboard and the mouse. Um, I just would like each of you to talk a little bit about, you know, just some of the opportunities for disruption. I mean, as you guys think about where can this go, not only for your own companies, what are the markets you can address, but how are, you know, how is my nine-year-old uh, going to be, you know, kind of interacting with the world digitally, uh, you know, in the decades to come? What are the things that this is really going to enable and open up for us as a society? I'll let anybody who wants to tackle that one first jump on in. So, so I'll start with uh, what Echopixel is doing. We see this all the time with our customer sites. Uh, radiologists are helping surgeons use images, and it's helping hospitals increase the number of surgeries that they're doing. Because now a surgeon has a way to use data that hospitals have had for over 40 years. And with confidence, say, we can have a positive outcome of that surgery. But it's not stopping there. It's also helping general practitioners communicate with the patients, or even sometimes nurses, uh, so that those patients can have better uh, compliance to rehabilitation. So we're really generating a lot of data through different layers of different inputs across the care cycle. And that's something that's very valuable. We see a lot of excitement in hospitals because you can uh, just see the, the explosion of data. Uh, but it's also something that's fundamentally really important for a hospital. More surgeries, they get more revenue, but surgeries without mistakes is allowing them to uh, save OR time, which is very expensive, $62 per minute on average in the U.S. So a simple mistake is, is 20 minutes, so that's $1,000 for a simple surgery. But sometimes these complex surgeries can be delayed four hours. So uh, there's just a lot of opportunity all across. And squeeze a lot of, of costs out of healthcare, which of course everybody's concerned about these days. Yes. What other things, David? Yeah, I think uh, ultimately what all this data is going to do is democratize information and, and because of that democratize opportunity. So if you look, uh, you, you kind of have to start first on why why is there this explosion of data? Well, if you look at where traces, for example, all of the hardware that goes into making trace work, and let's forget about all the computing that uh, Intel helps with, that would cost $10,000 10 years ago, and it would probably cost something like $1,000 uh, four years ago, and that's in the tens of dollars now. And so all of a sudden, you can collect all this data. And so if we look at sports, for example, a pro baseball team, every position player has his own videographer, there's three or four people who collect stats for the team and tell a pitcher about his tendencies and what he's doing wrong and things like that. And now you can have that opportunity really at the mass level. So instead of just having all of this information available at the top of the pyramid, it's coming down to the bottom of the pyramid. So just as an example, uh, we have a uh, soccer player who's a junior in high school and she wants, she was hoping to get a scholarship for college and so what she did is uh, her team uses Trace, and she just sends the link of all of the moments during the game that uh, she had an impact on the game. 
uh, to the coach at, in Al at Alabama, and the coach can see how fast she runs during the game. Is she covering the field correctly for her position? And then look at both the good and the bad moments that she had an impact in during the game. Instead of having to watch an hour and a half of footage and figuring out you know, which of these 11 players is this girl, um, it's all done automatically for you, and the coach can do it in, in five minutes. Uh, and she did end up getting a uh, scholarship to Alabama. And so these tools that people have had for at the pro ranks, you know, for years are going to drift down to, um, you know, the high school young adult level, and and it just increases opportunity and democratizes that for everyone. I, th I think I mean to echo that in the business that we're, we're in uh, with retail, it's about personalization. And there's so much information that has previously been very disparate. And if you think about you know, brick and mortar retail, and then we got online retail. 20 years ago, I was happy to get a box in two months, a month. That was fantastic. Now I want it tomorrow or I want it the same day. And I think the way that you get that is by having all this data. You can only do it by knowing the data, knowing the customer, and almost preempting what they want. And it's that proliferation of data that's allowing us to drive this personalized experience. And in ours, that's in the shopping world. That's definitely about meeting the customer wherever they want to be. And that's through a mobile device, it's through a computer, it's through the TV, it's in the store. It's like the perfect omni-channel experience that you only get by having massive amounts of data, both on product, which is what we do, on the person, which is what you know, any number of different companies are doing right now, and how you merge all that together is then creating these opportunities for just increased personalization, customization, and, and more, you know, I guess, sadly, when I listen to our medical uh, um, direction, it's like instant gratification. It's like we're, <laughs> we, we want things faster and, like, immediate. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the generation of these massive amounts of democratized data and the consumption of all this data also comes with a challenge, which is that, you know, humans, if you're wearing AR glasses and there's holograms everywhere you're looking, it's going to be pretty easy to be overwhelmed with the amount of data that's available and that's kind of in your face. So I think that presents an opportunity for startups to figure out how to curate that data. But if you want to curate the data, because you don't want the data to distract you, you actually want it to make your life better. But to curate the data for a specific person, you really need to have an intimate knowledge of what the person's interests and desires are and what information they think is just a distraction because they're driving uh, or reading, uh, and what information they really are interested in. So in a way, we're, we're trying to approach this problem by generating even more data. So what we do is we're tracking, we're taking thousands of measurements of your eye position every second, and we're storing it in a large database that's actually correlated with the experience. So we know exactly when you've started reading something, because we can see several saccades in one direction and a big saccade backwards. So we, we know not to distract you when that's happening. We also know when you're driving, we know when you're anxious. When you've had a coffee, your micro saccades actually start to rotate so that there are more lateral ones. So with this type of insight, we think we can have like a very intimate um, understanding of the user and, and kind of uh, curate the data so that it, it's, it makes their lives better instead of, uh, of making, making things more annoying. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I'm going to ask you guys to exit stage right, if I can remember my old high school drama days. Um, so the data has been captured from the world, and now it's moving into the stack. But before I can get there, all kinds of bad guys are lurking in the weeds to steal it. Uh, I'm going to call up the next group of CEOs uh, who we have grouped together, uh, talk about securing data. And while they're Coming up, I'm going to actually share a true story this morning as I'm getting ready to, to uh, leave San Jose and come up here, checking my email, and there's an email from American Express asking me if I really did buy that $1,500 plane ticket on Air Canada. Well, I didn't. So, uh, so now I've had to cancel my card. And uh, so I'm really glad to see you guys here, and I want you to be able to tell us uh, how you're going to stop that sort of thing from happening in the future. First of all, though, first, let's uh, go. We'll go here uh, right to left, Yuri on Tarani, and talk just a minute, introduce yourselves, and then while you're doing that, you could uh, take a minute or so to tell us uh, about the particular piece of, of security that you guys are attacking, because the thing that I personally get excited about with this group, we have four cybersecurity uh, CEOs, everybody taking dramatically different approaches to the problem. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuri, and co-founder and the CEO of a company named Eclipsium. 
Um, so there is no shortage of problems in security space. Uh, that's why we founded Eclipsium. Uh, more specifically, we're trying to solve, focus on solving one of the remaining blind spots for security industry, for the security teams in the organizations. And uh, so today, if we look, um, what's happening today is um, huge amounts of data, sensitive data is being compromised, being exposed um, by adversaries targeting enterprises. Um, and the share of value of that data, whether it's an intellectual property or personal data or financial or intelligence data, uh, far outweighs the resources attacker spent on finding new ways to compromise enterprise, but more importantly, new ways to stay hidden in the environment, embed themselves in the environment, and stay undetected for a long period of time. And so one of those blind spots is equipment. Every company has employees with laptops, workstations, servers, and data centers, other type of equipment. And they purchase that equipment from uh, different places. Uh, and there's no assurance of what happened uh, before the company got that equipment and deployed and started using it. Uh, because, of, because of the compromise of supply chain, that equipment can, can come preloaded with malicious implants at the firmware level, at the hardware level. And even after that equipment, those systems um, um, are, are used by the employees, by the, uh, by the organizations. Attackers are determined to find vulnerabilities in the firmware um, in those systems and uh, exploit them and persist in the target environment for months or years. So this is a, this is the, uh, this is a problem that uh, every company faces that handles high value data. And this is the problem Eclipse is focusing on solving. Um, so we have a team uh, which did uh, security research in that space for a number of years, and we're building on that expertise, research ex expertise. We're building an expertise from developing open source solutions in that space in order to solve that problem. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Jay Kaplan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Synac. I was that former NSA state-sponsored hacker that Peter was mentioning. Uh, before starting the company about five years ago. Um, I think one thing that that job certainly gives you uh, a, a unique perspective on is how pervasive the problem is in cybersecurity, how insecure this world is, how easy it is to really break into any system, network, um, terrorists in our case, that you're trying to break into with the right resources, motivation, and expertise. And I think that really, that experience really gave us the, the idea behind Synac where we take a radically new approach to helping organizations better understand what they look like to an adversary ultimately trying to break into that company. Um, and the way that we do it is by leveraging a global talent pool of top white hat security researchers in over 50 different countries. We take a crowdsourced approach to this problem um, and we, we pay them on a success basis to uncover security vulnerabilities across their technology stack. Um, so uh, basically a large uh, corporation would come to us, they say, hey guys, we need to know how someone's gonna get in, how, whether it's through the front door or through something on the side, um, use your hackers to help us, us figure that out. Um, we are building a whole technology stack to also um, uh, make this uh, you know, more controlled and trusted. Um, as you can imagine, crowdsourcing hackers might sound scary at first, but there's a, a lot of really cool things we are doing to, to make that much, a much safer process. Um, and um, it's uh, really exciting to see the efficacy coming behind a lot of the leading solutions and consultancies on the market today. So thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Itai. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Entezer. And what we are doing basically is we took the concepts of the biological immune system and applied them to cybersecurity. Um, and more technically speaking, we developed this technology which is very much like DNA mapping for software. So for any file or suspicious software running in your organization, we are able to identify the origins of every single piece of code in that file. And now this really allows us to detect the most sophisticated cyber attacks. For instance, we were able to detect a very famous ransomware called WannaCry by identifying several pieces of code, DNA, from North Korean hackers. And I invite you all to check that out actually in, in our booth late, later. Thank you. Okay. 
Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Rani Nachmias. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Alcid, a data center security company. So the evolving data center is a huge problem. It stores our most sensitive data. It has so many, so many moving parts, different cloud providers, multiple compute technologies, and different stakeholders, and it's changing rapidly. It's became the wild, wild west of cybersecurity, and it's almost and nearly impossible to secure. Gartner indicates that we will be spending $113 billion on protecting these data centers. And still, one out of four enterprise organizations will suffer a breach. Equifax is only the latest. There is a real need to think about how to secure these data centers. There is a real need to build solutions that will answer the ever-evolving and continuous changes in these data centers multiple compute technologies, multi-cloud, and how these data centers will be shaped in the next decade or two. I'll see this currently in stealth mode, so I can't tell you much about our technologies, but I can tell you and promise you this, it's completely different. Come and visit us at our booth. Thank you. Thanks very much. By the way, I, I wanted to mention, uh, we have a couple of the gentlemen on, on, the, on the dais here have come from very uh, long distances, and I, my, my heart goes out to you guys uh, with the, I can imagine the jet lag that you must be encountering. In fact, today of the 15 companies, we've got uh, five of them, or four of them are from, from outside of the United States. Uh, we've got companies uh, from Israel, from China, from Japan, from Canada, and so I really appreciate you guys making the effort to be here. Um, uh, Rennie, to a certain extent, you, you kind of, you stole my question or a little bit, but I, I, you know, I, I was thinking very much of the, uh, of the Equifax hack as we were kind of preparing for today, and the only thing it seems to me that's it's, as dramatic and breathtaking as it was, it becomes a little bit less dramatic and breathtaking when you realize that the next bigger one, the next bigger one is on its way. It's a, it's a, it's a certainty, as, as I've heard a cybersecurity CEO in the past say, there's two kinds of companies, those that have been hacked and those that don't know that they've been hacked. Um, so, or at least maybe those that don't want to admit that they've been hacked. I guess that might be a third category. So, so given that, we've got this, this huge risk-reward balance that enterprises and consumers have to face uh, because there is all this data, tremendous opportunities, also a tremendous target. So how do the good guys uh, stay ahead of the bad guys? Because it, it, it seems that if we can't do that, we run some real risks as a, as a, as a society and as, a, as business people. Uh, eventually, people might say, I'm not going to put my credit card out there. I'm not going to shop online. I'm not going to whatever. So how do you guys think about it? These are the kinds of things that keep you up at night. How do we think ahead to where the bad guys are going? Because we're going to slam a door and they're going to find a window. Feel free to jump in on that, anybody. Um, so before starting Intezer, I was actually leading the Israeli military incident response team, cyber incident response team. And my daily job was to try to outpace nation-sponsored attackers. And what I learned there throughout my journey was that in one hand, you can't really completely outpace attackers. But in the other hand, we can and we must uh, change this unfair, unfair equation where you can bypass millions of dollars worth of defense systems with only one hundred one thousand uh, dollar investment, and the way, by the way, uh, the way we are um, tackling this this problem is, with our technology, we force the attacker to essentially rewrite his whole code from scratch, and this really changes the whole equation because it makes uh, attacking an enterprise with such technology much much less cost effective. I oh, think sorry, it, uh, either sorry. one. Well, both at the same time. <laughs> so so I, th I think we need to stop thinking about cybersecurity and a digital um, economy um, like we are talking about them today. Um, I think cybersecurity is security, and the digital economy is the global economy. 16 years ago, when you tried taking down the U.S. economy, um, you could have sent a couple of planes and take down the World Trade Center, but cyber warfare is the way that you can take down global economies today. Equifax is only the latest, but you can now tackle an attack uh, by hackers and um, the digital economy by tackling media companies, the Silicon Valley, and you know what? Even politicians. I need, 
I, we, we, we need to think about these differences in a completely different way. I'm sorry to tell you, but the bad guys um, will outpace the good guys. Um, and the fight is not against necessarily protecting, it's eliminating the damage and limiting that damage. Build defenses within these ever-evolving data centers will eliminate and limit the damage. Out of the leakage that happens, Equifax is only one um, example, and the ever, and, and as I said before, these data centers that are changing constantly, just because how Intel is shaping it and building it and other companies, you need to build that defenses internally so you will know when, attack, when the attack happens and you can re really limit the damage going outside of the sensitive data. Jay, you had a thought. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at some of the stats, they're pretty staggering, right? Um, uh, there are a thousand breaches that were reported in 2016. That's a 40% year-over-year increase from the, from 2015. Um, that number is going to probably go up at the same pace this year. Um, and those are just the incidents that were reported. Obviously, a lot of companies are not reporting their actual breaches. Um, you you think about the number of devices going online. Um, 50 billion. IoT devices uh, are supposed to be online by 2020. Um, and then you look at the massive talent gap in cybersecurity, 3.5 open million cybersecurity jobs by 2021. How do you stay ahead? It, it's, it's almost an impossibility unless you start taking advantage of these new innovative solutions. Um, and for us, it's really about bringing uh, this crowdsource methodology where you take advantage of hackers for your defense, not necessarily for offensive purposes, but you try to figure out how are they going to get it in the first place. So let's not try to hire them. Let's actually leverage them on a freelance basis. Let's motivate them in ways that they've never been motivated before because they're only getting paid when they're successful at breaking into our networks and our applications. And we're finding that this is working. Um, and really, it only takes one vulnerability to, to, to get into an organization um, and, uh, and completely compromise the integrity of that entire organization. For us, um, let's get more eyes on the problem. Let's, let's deploy as many of these um, uh, hackers as we possibly can. Um, and, and hopefully, we can, we can at least stay one step ahead. I know it's a really hard thing to do, um, but um, but all of these innovative solutions, I think, are at least helping us move in the right direction. Um, so, Peter, um, <clears throat> after Equi uh, Equifax attack, I have started using my fidget spinner more extensively. So, short answer is invest in fidget spinners. Um, uh, longer answer is, well, it, the, this compromise taught us a few things. Uh, the first is the value of the data is uh, is huge, is increasing for attackers to determine to be determined to get that data out of the uh, organizations and we see that even software security controls have problems uh, for example software man uh, update management is still a problem for enterprises and continues continues to plague um, organizations but at least security teams in those uh, uh, organizations know how to how to handle uh, uh, those problems they have security controls in, in, at hand but What's about to become a, a, a much more terse problem for security teams is their understanding, uh, and more importantly, managing of a equipment risk, firmware risk, supply chain compromise risk, and the implication of that risk. So as an industry, we have to get ahead of that problem right now before attackers uh, apply it. Thank you guys very much. Uh, they will be around. I think they're over in uh, which corner are you guys over here, right? So please be sure uh, as, you're, as you're going around to to, uh, to find out more about these these gentlemen and, and the solutions that they're working on for an extremely important problem. I ask you guys to exit that way, if you would, please. Uh, the next group we're we are uh, putting under the category of managing data. So we've got the data into the stack. We've made sure that the bad guys aren't going to do anything with it. Now, my God, what are we going to do with all of this data? Where are we going to put it all? Um, it's uh, so. Uh, well, let's let's follow the same format as before. Let's take each a minute and uh, or, or two and have you guys introduce yourselves, talk about your your company, and then we can talk a little bit about uh, the, the collective problem you're trying to solve with with so much data being generated each and every year. Thanks, Peter. My name is Prasanna. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Reniac. 
First off, I want to thank Intel Capital. You know, it's a privilege to work with a company and partner with a company that practically powers every server in the world. Um, we are building software that helps customer deploy world's fastest database. That's it. So why do you care about that? Is because uh, just look at the amount of data that is being uh, accumulated today. It's growing at the pace of, as uh, it was shown uh, uh, you know, earlier today, that petabytes of data are being uh, accumulated. So the problem is you have size and capacity of data of a semi-track, but the customers want the speed of uh, F1. And we see that with the customers. And the way we help customers you know, solve this problem is essentially we use Intel CPUs, Intel's FPGA technology, and their advanced memory technologies with our software. And with this combination, with no software change, you get the world's fastest database. Thank you. Thanks. Back to you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kai. Uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of uh, Horizon Robotics. And we are a two-year-old company um, with a headquarter in Beijing. We have uh, about 300 engineers uh, working on uh, developing embedded AI solutions uh, for autonomous driving cars and for IoT. So uh, we take the approach which is uh, tightly integrating uh, software and hardware together to promise a high performance, uh, low power consumption, and real-time performance, and also low, uh, low latency. So um, in the morning, uh, Windows so talk just mentioned uh, uh, for autonomous driving car, uh, one car per day will produce uh, for uh, four uh, terabyte data. So we did some uh, simple comparison. So 1,000 cars uh, one day, uh, autonomous driving will collect data which is equivalent to the amount of uh, image data uh, indexed by uh, Baidu. So I mean, uh, when we talk about Big data, actually, even bigger data is ahead, mm. right? So that's the kind of challenge we are addressing. And uh, think about in China last year, uh, 28 million cars sold, and over 100 million de cameras deployed across the country. So this is a challenge, and we want to address the challenge from this big data in real time in on the device side. So that's why we take this uh, embedded artificial intelligence uh, solution, uh, which is uh, tightly integrating software and hardware together uh, to maximize the efficiency. And we are very excited to be a partner of uh, Intel, and we are very excited to be uh, in a, a family of uh, Intel capital portfolio uh, companies. And a lot of exciting uh, works uh, ahead to be done. Thank you. Very happy to have you. Stavros? Hi there. Uh, my name is Stavros Papadopoulos. I'm the CEO and founder of TileDB Inc. TileDB Inc. Uh, um, spun out of uh, the Intel Science and Technology Center for Big Data, which was an amazing collaboration between Intel Labs and MIT. Um, the company was created to further develop, maintain, and commercialize the TileDB software that I created um, while uh, working for Intel Labs and being stationed at MIT, I, I created it as a research project. We had some great success stories. We decided to, to, to spin it out. Um, TileDB is a, a system for managing massive multidimensional array data. And this data usually arises from scientific applications like genomics, medical imaging, satellite, uh, satellite imaging, and more. Uh, TileDB uh, integrates very well with multiple storage backends, unifying these, these backends and making it very easy for you to manage these big quantities of data. And also it, it interfaces very well with uh, data science programming languages and tools, making, again, very easy to, to, to manage the data through these applications. Uh, we typically target at huge, very ambitious projects where other solutions either fail or they incur enormous uh, costs of ownership. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And Stavros is one of at least two founders uh, that we're introducing today who uh, are Intel alums. So, uh, so welcome back to the family, Stavros. In this Good case. to be here. Yeah, thanks. Feeling at home. Great. 
so I've been warned that when I turn to address the panel, it's harder uh, for folks uh, uh, to hear me. So I will try to um, try to see if I can uh, do better. Um, so you know, we talk when you talk about data. There's all kinds of different ways to kind of quantify it. I mean, your your Baidu example is actually fascinating. Uh, another uh, uh, measurement that I've seen kicked around, and I'm sure you guys have too, is the amount of data. By the end of this decade, it's estimated the amount of digital data that's created uh, every single uh, year is going to be enough to fill a stack of DVDs that would stretch from here to Mars. That's a lot of data every single year. Um, so how can enterprises really avoid drowning in all of that? Uh, and secondarily, and maybe even more importantly, how do they find the, the needles that are hidden in that enormous haystack. That's a terrible mixed metaphor. You don't drown in a haystack, but I, hopefully you uh, know what I'm, what I'm looking for. It's, so it's, it's, it's again, this, this kind of challenge opportunity. Um, uh, when all this data is being created, it seems like it could easily overwhelm uh, uh, storage facilities and, and uh, data centers and, and the people who are running them and the, the CISOs and so forth. But on the other hand, uh, when it, it does create all this amazing opportunity if, you, if they've got the right tools. How do, how do enterprises balance this and how do entrepreneurs like you guys help them do that? Yeah, so uh, I see two aspects in, in this question. So on one hand, how do we uh, help companies avoid or enterprises uh, avoid drowning in the data? And second, how, so this brings up storage. And second, how do you get insights which implies analyzing the data which has to do with compute? So we have storage and compute. So for, uh, in, in TileDB Inc, we, um, we focus on the storage part by introducing a novel scientific format, which is that of the, of the multi-dimensional arrays, which is highly compressible uh, for the kinds of applications that we target at. So we are driving the costs of ownership down. So this is one of the things we do in terms of storage. The second thing is that we integrate with multiple storage backends, and this is very important because either different enterprises use completely different storage backends. For example, some may use uh, a private cluster, some others may use some cloud providers or different providers. And also, perhaps the same enterprise may use different types of uh, storage backends because, for example, their data may be in a different stage of their analysis. So depending on the stage, they may store the data in different, uh, in different backends. So um, this is the value that TileDB is bringing in terms of storage. Now, in terms of compute, a cost that is very easily ignored is that of fetching the data from the storage to the compute and also preparing the data to the appropriate format that the analytics application is, is expecting to use. So um, on, this, on this part, so first of all, TileDB fetches the data extremely rapidly. So we, we really optimize based on the, on the storage backend to fetch the data very, very fast. And the second most important thing is that the, the TileDB data are multi-dimensional arrays. It turns out that if you have a very high performance analytics application, multi-dimensional arrays are first class citizens to your application. So we eliminate the conversion cost. And finally, by interfacing very well with the data science tools, essentially we're creating a very thin layer between the, uh, the higher application, the front-end application, and the bare metal. Thank you. Uh, so I think over the last decades, uh, we, see, uh, we have seen a trend, uh, you know, putting all the data in a data center, uh, storage management uh, analytics. Uh, but I think uh, since now, uh, we're going to see another trend, which is uh, actually what we are doing. It's pushing the computation uh, of handling the data uh, into the ed I mean, edge side, the front end. So uh, because, um, I mean, um, as we mentioned, the, the data being uh, collected uh, from all the sensors, devices, and uh, uh, the bandwidth actually transmit to the data center is, uh, is a huge challenge. Um, and without mentioning even uh, managing the computation in a data center is actually expensive. It turned out to be very expensive. Uh, so uh, processing the data in real time at the place where data is being collected is actually uh, essential for many uh, IoT 
related uh, applications. Uh, I, I think uh, autonomous driving is one obvious example, right? It cannot rely on, uh, you know, uh, real-time uh, robust uh, uh, transmission uh, of the data to the uh, data center. And also uh, to make sure the uh, control decisions are, uh, are safe enough uh, you reliable enough. You have to, you know, uh, rely on the computation uh, locally. So I think uh, in the future we see the kind of uh, system where we have uh, 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 some uh, real-time computation in on device, and also we have big data analytics uh, to analyzing the process data from the uh, and the compressed data from the front end, and uh, uh, big data uh, modeling in a data center. So I think this kind of uh, hybrid uh, computational model, I think it's the future. So uh, then our focus is uh, our focus on the edge computing, right? Makes perfect sense. Osana, how about you? Well, the challenge is how do you find the needle in the haystack, right? And how do you find it as quickly as possible? Especially if online businesses have to find and keep the engagement of the eyeballs of the customer. You have to personalize it and they store user profile, user cookies, and all these data in these databases. So the challenge that we see with the customer is, I have to get to the answers quickly, but I have to look up a lot amount of data. A simple example is one of the customers we walked into, they said, look, we thought in this edge data center we would need about 20 systems. But by the time we account for our data growth, by the time we account for the number of times we have to replicate it to look at fast wrap, and the inefficiencies in the database, suddenly it's looking at you know, 80 servers. The, that's massive for them, and they have to replicate it across various edges. So we said, look, why can't you actually use this database that is actually scaling very well and it's very well intended to scale? Then we found out still there are performance bottlenecks. Gartner put a report out, said, look, 53% of these respondents did not move forward from pilot to production because of performance bottlenecks in these databases. So we come in and say, look, performance is important. Looking up massive amounts of data is important. FPGAs are great in actually I.O. access. FPGAs are great in actually speeding up things. Intel's cross-point technology is actually exciting to actually deliver the performance. How do you take advantage of this if you fundamentally believe this is going to be part of the future server systems? We said, look, we'll write the software. And the customer's remark is performance at zero effort. That's great. So that's what we actually ask for, and we deliver. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Um, if you would step off to the right there. Thank you. Around for more questions and bring up our last group. I'm uh, very pleased to report that we're on time. As you can imagine, as an engineering company, that's very important at Intel. Uh, more importantly, my wife will be shocked that I did anything on time. So thank you, everybody. Um, our last group here. Here we go. And Nate makes four. Analyzing data. So finally, here we are. We've, the data has made it in through the jungle, through the thicket. We figured out a way to uh, structure it and make, uh, in a way that we can actually figure out what to do with it. And that's where these gentlemen and their companies come in. Um, why don't we take just a minute and talk about how deep learning and uh, big data analytics and artificial intelligence are helping to find all kinds of uh, new ways that we can learn things from this data that we didn't even know were possible. Hi. Uh, uh, I, I'm, uh, my name is uh, uh, Soichi Masada uh, from C, uh, CEO uh, LeapMind, a uh, Japanese company. And our solution is a deep learning framework uh, for specific embedded uh, environment. So, uh, uh, so uh, we, uh, we conduct research and uh, development for the, uh, both for uh, software and hardware. Uh, so in software, uh, is uh, approach for the compression for deep learning calculation and uh, radius for the calculation and uh, deep learning network is compressed and uh, realized for the uh, radius for 500 times uh, calculation. And uh, hardware is used for the uh, FPGA and uh, high efficient and uh, low consumption and uh, low power. Uh, it, it is uh, realized for the uh, embedded deep learning. For uh, deep learning is a uh, problem is a very big uh, calcula uh, need uh, calculation and need to the, uh, use the 
G GPU, it should be used the GPU and uh, uh, cloud computing. And it is, uh, uh, this chip is running for the uh, 37 layers uh, on, on different network. And, uh, uh, ordinary is GPU for, uh, should be need to the uh, big GPU. And uh, realize for in this, uh, uh, if you, if our solution you use to the realize for in, in this learning the deep learning, so uh, I think uh, I, I hope uh, uh, our goal is uh, democratize for the deep learning and uh, uh, in future is easy to deep learn implementation for the uh, deep learning and uh, cheaper cheap learning to deep learning. So it is uh, meaning the democratized deep learning. Thank you. Cool. Hi. So my name is Rich Stoner. Um, I'm the CSO at Synthigo. And um, so we're a small venture back uh, startup based in the Bay Area. And we like to think of ourselves as a full stack genome engineering solutions provider, which is a lot of jargon, and I apologize. Um, and I'll get to what that means in a bit. But so. Our company was started by two computer engineers previously working at SpaceX with Elon that decided they wanted to apply computer engineering principles and engineering techniques to biology and biological research. And so over the past five years, we've really pushed and tried to develop you know, novel instrumentation and, and technologies that allow us to do things that otherwise people could not do. Um, we started with custom DNA synthesizers. We now are running a manufacturing environment 24-7 making synthetic RNA for CRISPR. And so CRISPR, for the, the audience here, CRISPR is this new genome engineering technology that allows almost anyone, researchers in industry and academia, go and actually modify DNA in almost any organism. And so the, it's an incredibly powerful biological technique, but it's still very new. And so we're on the cutting edge of this and trying to figure it out. So, you know, what we've tried to do as a company is really go from being a reagent supplier, being able to make the RNA, and actually understanding how it works. So our, our goals are simple. Um, the first thing is basically to transform the technology from an experimental technique into an actual tool that we can deploy with safety, with efficiency, in a cost-effective way so that people have kind of access to it. Once we have this tool in place, we can do some really cool things. We can actually start to study the genome and how genes work and how diseases, like, are actually manifest and the mechanisms behind them. We can speed up the rate of discovery in a way that you can't do with the, the previous techniques. And then finally, once we understand how these things are occurring and how these things function, we have the technologies and the tool set to go in and modify them. Um, but we need to get to that point first. And so while CRISPR is a very powerful technology, the informatics to actually power it, to predict how to edit and how to make these modifications in a highly efficient, safe way is where we're just getting started. And it's why we're on the stage today working with the Intel guys. It's, it's a, a computing challenge that we haven't even begun to tackle yet. So that's uh, us. Th thanks very much. By the way, I, I had to point this out when, uh, when Rich and I were talking earlier today. I said, hey, wasn't Chief Science Officer Dr. Spox? Yes. Uh, I, I can't do uh, a hand Mr. Thing. Spox, right, exactly. So <laughs> title, I just, I thought that was great. If I had that on my business card, I would be I, yeah. live, live, I live long and prosper, fun. right. Um, by the way, there's a, a note from the, from the tech folks in the back. Uh, please uh, hold your mics a little bit closer when you're talking. Um, so so thank, thank you, Peter. My name is Maysam Lavasani. I'm co-founder and CEO of Bigstream. Uh, we are in the business of accelerating big data machine learning applications, especially for uh, people that cares about, uh, you know, performance in terms of, you know, performance is not a uh, basically good to have things for, for good, good to have things for them. It's a must have in some situations, meaning you know, for example, a financial company is doing a lot of ETL, got a deadline to finish the processing by the end of the, to the end of the day before market closes, for example. Or, you know, you're doing a security analytics, um, and the, the, the you know insight from 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 the insight to action uh, time frame, you have to uh, the, the shorter you make it, basically the uh, uh, less probable the attacker risk could compromise your system, so on and so forth. We have this technology, we call it hyper-acceleration technology, that uh, has got two important characteristics. One is, um, you know, you don't need to change your existing code. We call it no, you know, zero code change acceleration because we have this uh, data flow 
uh, acceleration layer bet between the existing platforms and the hardware. Uh, number one and number two, we actually do the computation while the data is moving through the, I mean, source through the edge, and then the data center. We, we do the computation what, while this movement is happening. Actually, we call it inline acceleration. Um, uh, like I said, we um, the, the sweet spot, uh, and we think that in the future is happening more and more. We're seeing opportunities that people are limited by the amount of the computation power that they have. And uh, they can generate more revenue. They can do, um, you know, cool things if they have the compute power. Uh, and that's what we are targeting as a, you know, uh, target market. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Nate. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I know you guys have heard a lot of great presentations today, and as the last one, I hope you guys have a little brain space left to hear uh, one last story. My name's Nate Storch. I'm the the CEO and co-founder of Amenity Analytics, and we've built a natural language processing platform to deliver strategic insights to the enterprise. Uh, in practice, uh, let's start with, uh, with an example. Uh, we were approached recently by one of the world's leading financial services organization who had a problem. Their team was overloaded with data, too much information, and as a result, they were missing things. They were taking risks that they didn't know they were taking, and they were missing opportunities that they wanted to target. And so they asked us, could you help us be more efficient and more systematic in how we approach this? And the answer is yes. By analyzing SEC filings, by extracting insights from news, from broker research, from quarterly earnings call transcripts, from the web, we can populate, we are populating their risk systems, their internal systems via API and via microservices. We're populating their, their CRM through uh, the same type of methods so that they can systematically target the, the opportunities that they want to take. And at its core, it reflects our value proposition, which is to help our companies, help our customers drive revenue, to decrease costs, and to mitigate risks. At its core, uh, our technology addresses a fundamental uh, hole in today's data architecture, which is, which is text. Natural language processing is hard. Expertise is scarce. To go out and hire an uh, external firm is expensive and risky. Uh, and that's where we step in, is that we provide today's enterprise with a, a level of expertise uh, in natural language processing that currently is only held by a very small number of firms, the Googles, the Facebooks, the, the Apples of the world, who are using this for mission critical activities but they're hoarding it. And with our system, we can deliver insights from just about any type of text into your organization in a way that you can use it to, to address mission critical problems and deliver ROI. So um, we've been working with Intel since the, the very start of our company, um, and we're excited to continue that. So you know, I wanna thank Intel Capital for, for their support, and I'm looking forward to uh, broaching new frontiers in data and in AI with Intel. So thank you. I swear to God, I did not ask a single CEO to give us a testimonial, but, but thank you for them. Um, so here we are. This brings us to the end of our thesis. Everything can be captured as data, which means everything can be quantified. Uh, so that's a tremendous amount of power. And as they said on the, I think it was Spider-Man, how do we make sure that they can, that we as a society and as a society of technologists use that power for good instead of evil. Uh, you know, we can imagine a situation where I might be redlined on my insurance application because of something in my genetic profile, because now we understand things about my genetic profile on a level we've never seen before. We can understand things about climate change that we might not have seen before. As David from Trace was talking about, we can understand how the most minute variations can affect an athlete's performance. How do we set up the kind of uh, boundaries, the technical and the social boundaries, to make sure that businesses and average people really reap the benefits of these uh, abilities and that we're able to see amazing new moonshots and what's possible beyond maybe what any of us have thought about. Uh, how, where do we kind of find that balance between protecting and, and making sure that we can look past those fears perhaps that people have about how this information can be used to go out and really do amazing things? So. Uh, can I, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the answer, but you know, bottom line is actually you need more compute, okay, <laughs> for, 
for to do that. So the I think uh, well all these machine learning uh, AI systems that we talk about, you know, we are teaching them to perform and perform fast and good. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we need to teach them to be ethical as well. You know, a part of the training should be the fact that you know we want uh, not not only you know the, you, you need to perform fast and high quality. We need to. Uh, make sure that you know they respect privacy of the people, they respect basically whatever the regulation boundaries, whatever it is. And uh, like I said, um, and, and some of these cases, some of these data governance governance system needs to be online and kind of real time. Yeah. And uh, like I said, the, the, the message again is you know we need more compute power. We need more uh, basically uh, real time and online learning of. Uh, the system to be able to do that, yeah. Rich? Um, it's an interesting question, especially coming from where we're at with um, the, the types of problems we're trying to solve. Like right now, we, we write software and deploy systems to design so small, like 20 base pair sequences for a single genome, for a single target. Um, in five years, we're gonna be designing 1,000 targets across a thousand genomes every day in under an hour, and we need to figure out how to actually get to that point. So I completely agree with you. Compute is going to be a, a massive thing that needs to keep up with the, the deluge of data that's going to come along with it. Because if we, in order to do compute well on this size of data, um, it needs to be not just um, you know, a lot of it, but it needs to be specialized. So having the interactions with this, even this cohort and having the FPGA access or the accelerated databases will really go a long way in allowing us to not only extract a lot of information from the genomic information, but really also start to build systems that you can trust that are not only um, reliable, but are also safe in terms of their recommendations. And so that's, you know, we have a lot more to deal with than on the ethical side, but genome editing is going to happen, CRISPR is going to happen, we want to make sure we have the compute to keep up with it. And the safe and reliable piece is really interesting because I think there is, especially in your industry, and uh, when I first moved to Silicon Valley 20 something years ago, and I was covering life sciences as a reporter, uh, there is, you know, Franken foods, et cetera. People are worried about those kinds of things. But you and I were talking last night, and you had some really amazing thoughts about, you know, not just making sure, we'll talk about all the things yeah. that that makes possible to engineer, not just people, but. So, sure. So um, just kind of as a, a highlight, you know, the, the initial thinking is. Great, we can modify someone's genome to make them you know, not allergenic or, or not allergic to a certain type of like pollen or grass. We can also modify the, the plants themselves. We can modify the grasses, we can modify the corns. Um, and almost any biological thing, anything with DNA is a modifiable substrate. And having the models and understanding of knowing what to do, how to do it safely, how to do it efficiently, I mean, it, it's transformative. Um, and, and, you know, if we want to talk about the, the whole GMO story, I'm glad to, to tell you guys the whole tale back in our booth. But, yeah, it, it's fun times. Matsuda-san? Hi. Uh, so, uh, so deep learning approach and AI approach is a very difficult for uh, the uh, technology. And uh, so uh, I, I think that... Uh, provide for the state of the art technology, uh, like, likely the deep learning aid and uh, AI solution is very difficult for the, what, what kind of the purpose for the setting of the what can, kind of purpose. So uh, I think, I, I hope that our solution is changed to the, uh, so uh, more, more easy for the, uh, uh, useful and uh, cheaper for this solution, and uh, uh, this solution is meaning the deep learning and uh, AI solution. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I, I hope that uh, uh, so many easy uh, for the uh, state of the art technology, and we uh, will uh, will uh, will find out the new new way for the AI t solution and. Uh, any other uh, technology, yeah. And Nate, you get the last word. Well, <clears throat> I don't think we know yet what the increased adoption of AI is going to yield on society. There are certainly risks that it could, it could lead to horrible outcomes. At the same time, there are possibilities that it could, it could lead to great things. 
What we do know is that we have to watch this very closely. And I think we are at the point right now where we can embrace data. We can measure things more effectively. You know, we can regulate things that we've never been able to, to do in the past. You know, one of our areas of focus is, is regulation and helping financial institutions ease their regulatory burdens. Um, you know, I, I heard the other day that uh, there are uh, enough documents regulating and governing the European banking system, that if you printed them out on double-sided paper, that you could stack them as high as the Eiffel Tower six times. So how do you monitor that? How do you monitor that, that people are, are complying with that? How do you monitor what institutions in, in the future, what self-learning uh, what self-learning systems are, are doing to comply with the rules that we've set up as a, as a society. And I think we now have the, the capability to, to really address, start to address these types of issues. But it, 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 it's such early days that uh, it just bears careful watching. Great. I really thank you guys very much. If we could end this panel maybe with a round of applause, I'd, I'd appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for your time and commitment. Uh, this actually concludes the webcast version of our presentation. So for those who've been tuning in from home, we uh, appreciate it. Hope that you enjoyed it.